All right, before the break, we talked about uh, vascular pole, tubular pole. And that's a very useful clue to help you map out the different parts of the nephron. So once again, vascular pole, tubular pole. When you look at the whole nephron, uh, use that as the first clue to go through the nephron structures. For example, on this picture, that side with the blood vessels is the vascular pole. Mm -hmm. So then that's the tubular pole. So this is PCT. I'm just going to follow it down here. And then it goes to the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle always turns backwards this way. And then now you're into the DCT. The DCT always ends up by the vascular pole. And then the DCT will empty into the collecting duct. So once again, use the uh, poles as a clue, vascular pole, tubular pole. So what's all of this? A lot of PCT. I'm just going to follow it all the way down there. So it goes all the way down here. This is loop of Henle. Turns backwards. Now we're into the DCT, and it's going to go all the way back by the vascular pole. And then it's going to dump into the collecting duct. Okay. So I have a label here. I mean, we already went through all the parts. For example, once again here. Uh, on this picture, that's the Bowman's capsule. Don't call it glomerulus, you can't see it. Okay. Now this is the afferent arterial. I'm sorry, this is the interlobular artery going to afferent arterial. That's it going in. And coming out is the efferent arterial. So which capillaries are these? The PT or paratubular capillary, very good. Okay. Now um, you also have um, the different parts here. So, if that's the afferent arterial, there's the efferent arterial, but the other side is the tubular pole. So this is PCT, that's the loop of Henle. The DCT always ends up by the vascular pole, and then it goes into the collecting duct um, all the way down. So what they show you here is the efferent arterial can either go into a paratubular capillary, or the efferent arterial can go straight down to the basal recta down here. So again, yet again, down here, vasa recta, here it is here too, or paratubular capillary up there. Yes, sir. Yeah? From the last uh, figure that you showed us, the short loops of Henle don't have any uh, vasa recta? Like, no, they don't. So do yeah, they, that's a good point. Do they use the salt gradient? They, they don't. That's why they're not good at concentrating urine. Okay. And they barely dip into it. Um, but yeah, that's a good point. Associate the vasa recta with those long nephrons. Associate the PT with the shorter ones. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that picture we looked at, so this is the same picture we looked at. There's the Bowman's capsule. There you can see the um, glomerulus inside. Okay. All right, so here's a different picture. Um, so once again, vascular pole. And then the vascular pole, you should be able to tell which is which. Is that, that one afferent or efferent? What do you think? This is efferent, and how do you tell? Well, the one that's a direct branch off interlobular artery is the afferent. Okay. So that, there's the Bowman's capsule, there's the PCT. I'm going to follow it down to the loop of Henle, and it's going to follow it back up. And you, you always have to see the DCT, it's going to pass close to the vascular pole, and then it's going to dump into the white structure, which is the collecting duct. Once again, the capillaries up here are paratubular and down here is vasa recta. So always use your arterial artery and vein as a landmark. Here it's labeled for you, um, so you can study that. Here's another one. We have it's ours is on a black board, and um, well, once again, um, well since it's numbered, I'll just do the numbers. That's Bowman's capsule. You should be able to tell the difference between two and three. Is two afferent or efferent? It's the afferent, three is the efferent, four is number four. Oh, yeah, there's oh. <laughs> Four is the purple DCT, five is the more numerous, longer tube, the PCT, number six, collecting duct, seven and eight are arcuate artery and vein, nine, interlobular artery, okay. Uh, 10, interlobular vein, 11. Okay, this is a loop of Henle. 
Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change that leader line to point to this one down here, okay, for loop of Henle. Um, because do you see how the loop of Henle is thin, and then but there's a thick part. I'm more interested in this thin descending part and the thick ascending part that 12 is pointing to for the loop. I'll, I'll get into that later. 13, vasa recta. 14, which capillaries are those? Paratubular, yeah, PT. And uh, it stops there. Yeah. Anyways, that's um, here it is labeled on uh, this slide here. Um, all right, so I want to get into the physiology of the filtration mechanism. Infiltration, glomerular filtration, that's all it does. There's not even gas exchange. The filtrate is a filtration of the blood, specifically the blood plasma. And it contains all the plasma components except proteins, which are a little bit too large to make it to, through the filtration membrane. As I said earlier before the break, things are secreted into the filtrate. If they are not reabsorbed, they're excreted to the urine. So the urine contains all the nitrogenous waste products the body doesn't need, like creatine, urea, uric acid. These are basically the uh, nitrogenous waste products we're talking about. So we'll focus on the filtration membrane in this part of the lecture. We kind of looked at that before the break. We defined parietal and visceral layers. Here's a close-up picture. You can see this part here is stripped away. You can see that the glomerular capillaries have fenestrations. Remember when I taught you continuous fenestrated sinusoidal capillaries as types of capillaries? These are fenestrated capillaries. which are just holes, they're pores, they allow fluids to escape. And the thing is, you kind of want to limit the filtration. You don't want to lose everything to the filtrate. So you kind of limit the, um, the filtration by putting these filtration slits around the glomerular capillaries. So the potocytes um, wrap around. glomerular capillaries. And they form filtration slits around the capillaries, forming filtration slits. And the slits are the little spaces in between the, pot of, uh, the foot processes and the potter site. Okay. So the, the slits will make for a better filter. It, it'll keep most of the substances you don't want to filter in the blood. So this is a very good filter. This filtration membrane, it's kind of outlined here. Filtration membrane. So basically, you got the fenestrations or the pores and the filtration slits, Th those um, are kind of sealed together with the basement membrane to form a filtration membrane. So um, what you're looking at here, um, let me see if I can do this. How about uh, straw? A big cell, all these foot processes. Here's my uh, potocyte cell. Processes and right there. Foot process. There's many of them. What they're doing is they're um, there's a connective tissue basement membrane, and you know it's made out of protein, which which carry a negative charge. The 
point is, the BM, base membrane, it's connective tissue. And that is kind of like uh, adhering the foot process to the other side, the cells of the capillary endothelium, of the glomerular capillary. So what they do is they draw So these are endothelial cells of glomerulus. So those endothelial cells, I said, you have fenestrations, and I, I put it there, I mark it, that fenestration has been measured 70 nanometers. It's a big hole. So you don't lose too much. I mean, you, you want to be a good filter. You don't want to just filter everything and lose everything to the urine. You want to be a good filter. And so you have fenestrations bounded by these little filtration slits. Say that little space just right in there, that little space between the feet. Okay, and you call that a Filtration slit measured at 14 nanometers. So you have the slits and the fenestrations, and <clears throat> if you're going to pass through the whole thing, you you got to be <clears throat> you got to fit through that slit. You may be big enough to fit through that fenestration, but then you have to fit through the slit. Okay. So this um, and because the proteins, negatively charged proteins are in the basement membrane. The filtration membrane favors the filtration of small negative molecules. So this, these three things, the ECs, the processes, the basement membrane, we call that filtration membrane. Filter is based upon Two things. One, size. <clears throat> Favors small things being filtered through, right? Favors small. Charge. Because it's negatively charged, it well, if given a choice, it, it'll prefer that positive things will get through there more easily. Now, negative things can get through. I mean, this is not a hard and fast rule, but principally small positive things are more favorable to make it through. So, um, there's my picture on the left. I just kind of drew it sideways. Anyways, the one, two, three are the one, two, three things I drew here. One, foot process. Uh, two, the basement membrane, and the third thing is the uh, glomerulus, being able to filter through the pores, the fenestrations, and the filtration slits. I showed you this picture before. Let me turn the lights off. Well, it projects pretty well with the lights on. And you can see the glomerular capillary on the inside are the fenestrations, those round little holes, peppered all the way throughout here. But if you look at the glomerular capillary on the outside, there's the uh, cell body of the autocyte. And uh, the real picture is way more impressive than the illustrator can do. Okay. I mean, you can see all the little foot processes and how they're jigsaw puzzled together with other foot processes to make the slits. So you can see how this is a, a very effective filter. It's finely filtered. You're just not losing everything. You're just filtering through very small particles with fluids. Okay, that's what makes it a good filter. So I kind of answered my own question. What makes it a good filter? Qualitatively, kidneys, glomerular capillaries, they filter blood plasma just like any other capillary bit. But quantitatively, the glomerular capillaries, they produce 180 liters of filtrate daily. So they're, they're, that's a lot of throughput, right? 
contrast that to like two to four liters by other capillary beds. So the million or so of these you have in each kidney that they're putting through 180 liters. Now what's your average blood volume? Five liters, but only half of that is plasma, right? Approximately. So maybe two and a half liters, but you're filtering two and a half, I mean, you're filtering 180 liters a day. So it's like, that's almost more than 70 times a day. And uh, if you're trying to filter toxins out of the blood, the kidneys will do it. And so you have to consider the pressure differences there. And we talked about this before, but, we, but what we now have to consider is that this thing is surrounded by a capsule. And the capsule um, provides a pressure against filtration. So what you've got to do is simply add all of these things up. And you want to calculate the net pressure that pushes fluids out to here. So let's call this. Calculation of NFP, net filtration pressure. Calculate NFP, or sometimes I just call it FP, but you see it right there on the slide, the filtration pressure. You got the outward pressures, that that's what you want. You want to push the fluids out. But then you have to like make sure they're greater than the inward pressures, fighting against. So that's what it says here. Outward pressures, and you want to subtract the inward pressure. So they put HPGC. That's the main one. HPGC stands for hydrostatic pressure. The GC is glomerular capillary. Okay, that's the main pressure, and it's pretty high. Remember, mean arterial pressure is, is about 93 millimeters of mercury. And in other capillary beds, maybe it's like 35, but here it's a little bit higher. It's 55. The hydrostatic pressure of the glomerular capillaries is 55 millimeters of mercury, so that's much higher. But you have a lot of pressures, inward pressures fighting against it. So that's HPCS and OPGC. Minus HPCS. Okay, that's the hydrostatic pressure of the capsule. That's the capsular pressure. Bowman's capsule is filled with fluid. HPCS. And so if you're trying to push fluid into a fluid filled capsule, um, you're pushing against it. So that's why it's like fighting it. So it's 15 millimeters of mercury. Okay, the other one is the OP. We talked about that before. It's the osmotic, oncotic pressure of the blood itself, of the, of the uh, glomerular capillaries. So they call that OPGC. Before, when we, we talked about it before, that was the um, just the blood, blood colloid osmotic pressure that we talked about before in the capillary change. Colloid osmotic pressure. This is just like, you know, in the glomerular capillaries, just um, it's 30. Um, so that should be a plus sign. If you add these up, you need to subtract it from that. Because these two pressures, um, I'm going to label it. It's the out versus the in. It's an inward pressure. This is an inward pressure. And this one is the out. And you want the out. The out is good. The out means you're filtering, so you'll produce urine.
So our NFP is what? 10. So that's 10. Uh, that makes it a good filter. You're, you have enough pressure to push out the fluids into that capsular space into the nephron. So you'll produce urine. You don't have to be a nephrologist to know that if uh, you got a urine bag on your catheterized patient and they're, they're not making any urine, the kidneys stop producing urine. That's uh, renal failure, as they call it. Well, anyways, on this slide, I I'm also trying to get you to see anatomically why that number is so high. Because you need that number to be high to have a positive NFP. Okay, so why is the pressure so high? is largely to do due to that arterial capillary arterial arrangement. So in this slide, I'm asking you to consider, as I had mentioned before, why is the uh, glomerulus such a good um, filter? Well, you have to be able to push a lot of fluids through. So anatomically, you have this um, the glomerulus versus, say, other capillary beds, regular capillaries. In a regular capillary, it goes arterial. You have capillary bed with gas exchange. And on the other side is a vein, a venule. Provides less resistance, okay? Here's the arterial blood coming in. But because there's less resistance on the other side, the net result is you, compared to the glomerulus, you're, you're gonna filter less. Whereas in the glomerulus, because you have this you have the afferent arterial going in. Blood going in to the glomerulus. No gas exchange. We'll make it all red. And then on the way out, another arterial. That efferent arterial provides more resistance. Because it's more resistance on the way out, you end up filtering a lot more through the glomerular capillaries. So that's really the take-home message of this arterial capillary arterial arrangement. Arterial capillary arterial. <clears throat> so that's the key there. So you filter more, I, I give you the numbers here, like you know, one, 180 liters a day. It's about 70 times your plasma volume. So the term for that is high renal clearance. You're just gonna clear it out and you're gonna keep the toxic uh, products low in the blood. Okay. Filter more, call it high Renal clearance, clear it out of you. And there are ways that they can test this uh, in the lab. The kidneys aren't working so well. Here's a picture of the uh, the surface area of the glomerula. A lot of surface area. Uh, the glomerular filtration rate. Okay, let's see. Here.
Yeah, I think it's a good place to stop. This is more physiology, but I, I start to want to give you time to study the urinary models. Yesterday I posted all the urinary model forms, and I think I've taught enough so you can start to study the models. So I'm going to stop this and uh, put your model brains on and just uh, 